Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our great physiology playlist. We have talked about cell physiology, cell membrane physiology, autonomic physiology. Now it's time for nerve physiology. It's time for the action potential, baby, where your nerve's electrical potential has experienced some kind of action. With that said, now let's get started. First of all, I gotta apologize, or in the words of Dr. Jordan Peterson, well, I've descended into chaos. I should get my house in order before I criticize the world. So I've made two stupid mistakes that are unexcusable. First mistake is when I told you before that autonomic is never sensory, autonomic is always motor. This is BS. Actually, autonomic can be sensory, it also can be motor. The second mistake is when I draw a picture confusing the dorsal root with the dorsal ramus of the spinal cord. They are not the same. And I will correct these in the next slides. This is video number 41 in the physiology playlist. Video 1 through 25 was the cell membrane, thick principle, donin equilibrium, osmosis, active transport, diffusion, etc. And then from 26 to 40, this is the autonomic nervous system. And then from 41 onwards, we'll talk about the nerve physiology. After watching autonomic nervous system physiology, if you wanna take it to the next level, go to my website, get you my autonomic nervous system pharmacology course. Also, after watching the nerve physiology, go to my website to get the CNS pharmacology course. That's some integration, baby. Let's go back to square one. Here's your cell membrane. Here's your extracellular fluid, and this is your intracellular fluid, okay? Intracellular fluid, you have potassium is more prevalent on the inside than on the outside. Magnesium, more prevalent on the inside. Phosphate, on the inside. Proteins, on the inside. How do you remember it, medicosis? Well, if you're talking about the inside or the ICF, everything here starts with a P. Potassium, phosphate, proteins. How about magnesium? This is in the supernova, so it's also a P. Anything else is gonna be more prevalent in the extracellular fluid. Also, you gotta understand that cell membrane transport is passive or active. Passive is the same thing as diffusion, which means uh, we need no energy and we happen along the electrochemical gradient. From high concentration to low concentration, we have three subtypes, simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. On the other hand, you have the active transport. We have active carrier and active vesicular. Active vesicular, endocytosis and exocytosis. Get it in, get it out. How about a carrier active transport? First of all, it's active, therefore we require ATP. It's a carrier, we require a carrier, and we happen against the gradient from low concentration to high concentration. That's why we need energy, baby. And then we have the primary active and secondary active. It's like the train. You exert energy here, and the secondary is dependent on the energy exerted by the primary. What the flip is an electrolyte. Electro means electrical. Light means a substance that can be decomposed. Look at this beautiful hydrochloric acid. Put it in water. It's going to dissociate. It's going to decompose into positive protons and negative chloride. This is the cation and this is the anion. Why is a cation positive? Well, because it's attracted to the negative pole, aka the cathode. And that's why we call it the cation, because cathode. How about the anion? It's the negative because it's attracted to the positive pole or the anode anion anode. Sodium is the major cation in the extracellular fluid. You know why? It's thanks to the sodium potassium pump. It's pumping sodium to the outside and pumping potassium to the inside. This is a primary active transporter and that's why you have more sodium on the outside than on the inside. How about potassium? It's the major cation in the ICF. You have more potassium on the inside than the outside. You wanna know why? It's thanks to the sodium potassium pump. How about chloride? It's the major anion in the ECF. You don't know why? Sure. Sodium is pumped out, potassium is pumped in. Sodium is positive, right? Yeah, you're pumping more positive to the outside than you're pumping positive to the inside. Positive attracts negative. Therefore, chloride is gonna be attracted to sodium and you will have more sodium and more chloride in the ECF. Chloride follows the sodium, just like how the cameraman follows the YouTuber. Actions have consequences, and so do pumps. The sodium potassium pump have many consequences. Okay, first of all, you have more sodium in the ECF. It's thanks to the sodium potassium pump. Second, you have more potassium in the ECF. Got it. You have more positivity outside than on the inside. Why is this? because you're pumping three positive to the outside and two positive to the inside. You're pumping more positive to the outside than to the inside, and that's why the outer surface is more positive relative to the inside, and the inside is more negative relative to the outside. And that's why the resting membrane potential is negatively charged. It's thanks to your sodium potassium pump. 
I need to get my house in order. So your nervous system is made of central and peripheral nervous system. Central is brain and spinal cord. Peripheral is anything coming out of the brain or out of the spinal cord. Out of the brain, we call it cranial nerve. Out of the spinal cord, that's your spinal nerve. White matter versus gray matter. Which one is myelinated? Well, myelin is a protein that is bound to fat. It appears white. So in the spinal cord, you have myelin here on the outside and you have non-myelinated fibers on the inside. However, the brain is the other way around. The gray is on the outside and the white is on the inside. Translation, the myelinated fibers are on the inside, but the non-myelinated are the, on the outside. Which one is faster? Myelinated. Which type constitutes the majority of the neurons in our body? Unmyelinated. Well, why is this? If the myelinated are better and faster, why don't we have all of them myelinated? Because myelin is very expensive. We gotta economize in a world of scarce resources which have alternative uses. If all of your neurons were myelinated, you would be as obese as a dinosaur and you would eat 17 meals every day and spend the rest of the day in the bathroom. Central nervous system, brain and spinal cord brain is made of the cerebrum, cerebellum and brainstem. If you are a sophisticated person, prosencephalon, mesencephalon and rhombencephalon. Spinal cord is made of cervical segments, so that thoracic segments, lumbar, sacral and coccygeal segments. How about the peripheral nervous system? You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Some of these cranial nerves are sensory, some of them are motor, some of them are mixed, but all of your stinking spinal nerves are mixed. Every single one of these is sensory and motor at the same time. And if you get lucky, you can even add autonomic on top of these. Nervous system could be somatic or autonomic. What's the difference? Somatic is something is, is that you can control. It is voluntary, but autonomic you cannot control. It's involuntary. Each is subdivided into motor and sensory, motor and sensory. Motor takes you from your brain to the extremities. Like let's say when I move my leg, the impulse is going to start in your brain and it's going to end up in your leg. Okay, let's say I want to feel my leg. It's the opposite. The sensation starts from your leg and goes until it reaches your brain. And therefore we have four types of fibers. We have SE, SA, VE, and VA. What the flip is SE? Somatic efferent, because if you are motor, you are efferent. What does efferent mean? I'm going to the leg. To is efferent. How about sensory? No, I'm afferent. What does afferent mean? Afferent means from. I'm going from my leg to the brain. Somatic efferent, somatic afferent. How about autonomic? Autonomic is the same thing as visceral. So you have visceral efferent going down, visceral afferent going up. Ergo, autonomic can be sensory, unlike the stupid doofus called medicosis who told you in previous videos that autonomic is never sensory. Nonsense. Autonomic can be motor, it also can be sensory. Example, the baroreceptor reflex is an example of an autonomic reflex. Do you feel it? Can you feel it? No, it's working right now, but you have no idea it's working because it's autonomic, it's visceral. Some very important definitions. This is the soma, this is the axon, perfect. A collection of somas, when it's present in the central nervous system, is called a nucleus, such as the facial nerve nucleus, the nuclei of the trigeminal nerve, etc. A collection of somas in the peripheral nervous system is what's known as a ganglion, with the exception of the basal ganglia. A collection of these doozy axons in the central nervous system is known as a tract such as the corticospinal tract, corticobulbar tract, spinothalamic tract, etc. A collection of axons in the peripheral nervous system. This is what we call a nerve. Here's your brain. Draw a line in the sand. This line is at the central sulcus. Anything in front? Motor. Anything behind? Sensory. Most of the time. Don't believe me? Consider this. I want to move my leg. Primary motor cortex in front of the line. I want to feel my leg. Feelings are primary somatosensory cortex behind the line. I want to talk to you. Talking is broker's area in front of the line, but I want to understand you. Oh, reception. Oh, this is a sensory thing. This is called Wernicke's. It's on the back of the line. I want to move my eyes in front of the line. I want to see. Vision is sensation, which is behind the line. Same thing in the spinal cord. You draw a line in the sand, a line at the sulcus limitans. May it rest in peace because this is an embryological structure that went away. However, the concept still remains. Anything in front, usually more anything behind sensory with some exceptions. Therefore, this dorsal or posterior or afferent root is sensory, period. And therefore, the efferent or anterior or ventral root is motor, end of story. 
And that's why the spinal nerve has both sensory and motor. It's a mixed nerve. Now, there is a difference between the root and the ramus. This is the dorsal root, but this is the dorsal ramus. Conversely, this is the ventral root, and here is the ventral ramus. Dorsal root is purely sensory. Dorsal ramus has sensory and motor because it came from the spinal nerve, which is mixed. By the same token, the ventral ramus has both sensory and motor fibers. What is the difference between dorsal ramus and ventral ramus? Dorsal ramus is going to your back, ventral is going to your front. What do you mean by my back? Uh, yeah, the skin of your back and the muscles of your back. Why does it go to the skin of my back? Because it's sensory. Why is it going to the muscles of my back? Because it's motor. Can it be autonomic? Almost never. How about the ventral ramus? Oh, it's going to the skin of your front, anterior abdominal wall, anterior thoracic wall, etc. Why? Because sensory. It's going to muscles of anterior abdominal wall, anterior thoracic wall, etc. Because it's motor. This has somatic and visceral, aka autonomic fibers. What is the structural unit of your nervous system? The neurons. How about the functional unit? The reflex arc. Let's talk about the neurons. Some of your neurons are myelinated, other are unmyelinated. But all of your neurons have something called the neurolemmal sheath. Back to the myelin. If I am myelinated, who made my myelin? If you are in the CNS, thank the oligodendrocytes. If you are in the PNS, thank you, Schwann cells. Questions. Do all of your nerves have Schwann cells? Oh no, medicosis, only the myelinated neurons have Schwann cells. Shut up. All of your nerves have Schwann cells. The difference is, are they active or not? If the Schwann cells are active, they will give you myelin. If they are not active, they will not give you myelin. I don't believe you. Let me talk to you about the neurolemmal sheath. You know there is another name for the neurolemmal sheath. It's called the sheath of Schwann. Oh! So all of your peripheral neurons have to have a Schwann cell. If it's active, you become myelinated. Inactive, you're unmyelinated. Myelinated are better, but they are more expensive. What do you mean by better? They are faster. Look at this, 100 meters per second or 10 meters per second. Look at the animal, only one meter per second. Slow relative to the myelinated. And then you have thick myelinated and thin myelinated, type A and type B. The ugliest one is type C. Very small, very narrow, no myelin. The cross section is so thin, which is a good thing if you happen to be an anesthesiologist or a freaking dentist. Because if it's thin, it's gonna be rapidly affected by local anesthetics such as lidocaine. However, look at this myelinated thick fiber. Look at how thick it is. Give local anesthetic, it's not gonna affect it that much. It takes a lot of time and a lot of lidocaine in order to affect the type A fibers. So when you go to the dentist and the freaking dentist injects you with lidocaine, you become numb. You cannot feel pain because pain is transmitted by C fibers. Yet you can still move your cheeks because your motor fibers are type A. They are less affected by lidocaine and if they are affected, they will be affected later. This is integration, baby. Nerve physiology is all about the action potential. First of all, we gotta understand the why, because as Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Medicosis says he who has a why to the action potential can bear almost any mechanism. So first question, why do we need action potential? How does your muscle contract? Action potential. How does your skin feel? Action potential. How does your gland secrete? Action potential. Whether you're talking about an endocrine gland, such as your pancreas secreting insulin, or an exocrine gland, such as your lacrimal gland secreting your doozy, precious crocodile tears. How does your eye see? Action potential. How does your ear hear? Action potential. How does your brain think? Ah, thoughts are action potential. Napoleon Hill once said, Thoughts are things, powerful things at that, when mixed with definite, definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches. All right, Medicosis Nuggets of Medicine. By the end of this course, you will have collected many nuggets. So nugget number one, why do we need action potential? Because everything in your body needs action potential. Nugget number two, the nerve impulse is unidirectional. It goes from here to here, only one direction, cannot go backwards. But, 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 hey, medicosis, how about retrograde axonal transport? Yes, you're transporting some materials, some substances this way. But I'm talking about the freaking nerve impulse, not any substance, okay? Let's be precise. So the nerve impulse will go from here to here, okay? Until you end up with the axon terminals or the axon terminus or the axon knob. 
And then the Nabi will find some vesicles. These vesicles will rupture. Boom! Because calcium is the hero of contraction. It's going to contract the vesicles. The vesicles are going to release whatever was inside. Let's say acetylcholine. And then acetylcholine will go from here into the postsynaptic membrane to carry out an action. Medicosis nugget number three. The nerve impulse starts at the axon hillock. This neck. Oh, why is this? Because this is the most excitable part of the axon. It did not start in the cell body. Get your head out of your sphincter. But what's the function of the cell body? Nutrition to the entire cell. Medicosis nugget number four. During rest, aka resting membrane potential, also known as the polarized state, the inside of the membrane is negative. So you have negative on the inside and positive on the outside, two sides of the same coin. However, at the point of activation, aka reversal of polarity, what, what, what the fuck is that? Now the inside is positive, but the outside is negative. This is reversal of polarity, what we call tongue-in-cheek depolarization. D means no, but it's not actually depolarization. The most accurate word is reversal of polarization. Depolarization is just so simplistic, but it helps. It's just easier. It has a better ring to it. During depolarization, the inside of the membrane is positive. Depolarization is activation. So here is resting, but this is activation. Let's go back to resting. Resting state, you have more negative on the inside. Okay, how about the activated state? You have more positive on the inside. So let's say that I was resting and suddenly sodium decided to enter. Sodium is positive. When sodium comes in, it will make the inside positive. Hashtag activation, hashtag depolarization. Okay, how about chloride entering? Well, chloride is negative, right? Yeah, if a negative is entering, it's gonna make the inside more negative. This is gonna me make me more inactive. Hashtag inactivation, hashtag hyperpolarization. More of the resting state, more negativity inside. Third, what if potassium is leaving? Potassium is positive. When the positive is leaving, the inside is left to be more negative. Hashtag inactivation, hashtag hyperpolarization. If you can understand these three tricks, you are way ahead of the game. Let's take it to the next level. Medicosis clinical ties. Arrhythmia and antiarrhythmics. First of all, what is arrhythmia? I will describe just tachyarrhythmia. Tachyarrhythmia is when your heart is beating like crazy, so fast. How can we treat this? Well, give an antiarrhythmic. What the flip is this? It's a drug that works by inhibiting the sodium channels. So what? Sodium will not be able to enter. So what? Positive will never come in. So what? The inside of the membrane will remain negative. Hashtag no depolarization. Hashtag no activation. And your heart will calm down. Mission accomplished. And that's why sodium channel blockers are class 1 antiarrhythmics. And these are the four classes. Here is a woke mnemonic to remember them. Medicosis clinical tie number 2. Sedatives and hypnotics such as benzodiazepines and barbiturates. How do you think they work? Basically, they increase chloride influx. So you mean more chloride is coming in? Sure, chloride is negative, right? Yes. And when negative is coming on the inside, it's gonna make the inside more negative. Hashtag inactivation, hashtag hyperpolarization. So your brain will become inactive. And that's why they are sedatives. Because if your brain is crazy, let's say you have seizure. We would like to counteract this. We would like to make your brain calm down. Hashtag hyperpolarization, hashtag inactivation. Look at the clinical indications of the sedatives and hypnotics. Seizure, sure, your brain is like crazy. Calm the brain down. How? Get the chloride in. Therefore what? Inactivation. These are used for anesthesia induction. We can use them as muscle relaxant. Sure, my muscle is contracting like crazy. Tell my muscle to calm down. How? By getting the chloride in and therefore causing inactivation by preventing the depolarization. Anxiety, insomnia, etc. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Question of the day. This is the 13th question. The previous 12 are in this playlist called physiology. Most neurons are excited due to sodium influx, sodium coming into the cell. Except what kind of neurons which are excited due to potassium influx. Is this even possible? Yes, indeed. And we're talking about physiology, not pathology. Let me know the answer in the comment section. You'll find the answer in the next video. Now let's review benzodiazepines from Picmonic. Let's go. Benzodiazepine is depicted by the benz dice. 
It's the first line for status epilepticus. Yes, because it's a sedative hypnotic. Here is seizure, seizure. Also for anesthesia induction. Here is a nest inducting duct with some IV fluid. You can also use it for anxiety. Here is the anxiety bag. And for eclampsia, here is the E clamping on pregnancy. These drugs end in ZPAM and Zolam. Mechanism of action is increased. The frequency of chloride channel opening, which will lead to chloride influx, therefore inactivation, therefore sedation. Side effects of benzodiazepines include decrease the REM sleep, CNS depression, and dependence. In cases of benzodiazepine overdose, you can treat it using flumazenil. Here is the flute may snail. If you want to learn about anti-epileptics, anti-depressants, anti-psychotics, anti-Parkinson's, opiates, anesthetics, stimulants, and sedative hypnotics, go to my CNS pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalist.com. You can download it once and keep it for you forever. Also, you can learn about the anti-arrhythmics, anti-hyperlipidemics, anti-angina, anti-hypertensive diuretics, and didoxin by downloading my cardiac pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalist.com. You can watch free samples on my YouTube playlist titles Cardiac Pharmacology. And for a limited time, you can get a 25% discount towards anything on my website, including my CNS Pharmacology course, Antibiotics course, Cardiac Pharmacology course, Acid Base Imbalance course. Just use discount code SAVE25 at checkout only for the next 25 students. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to Picmonic for more than a thousand medical mnemonics. Go to my website to download my premium courses. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.